Merlin, Sister Matter, for the kind introduction and the prayer, and for inviting me to share my perspective on Dominican spirituality. So often we hear about discerning what we're called to do in this life, and for many years I made it into a very complicated undertaking to try to understand whether I was hearing or properly responding to, to any such call, and eventually I decided the call is usually someone's voice on the other end of the phone asking you to do something that you'd never think of doing yourself. So when Sister asked me to present Dominican spirituality as part of this series, I mounted some serious reasons why she should be talking to one of the scholars of our community or one of the sisters who have lived this charism for so many years. But she insisted they wanted my perspective as an associate of the community. And I do believe that God only asks of us what he's already given us. And what he's given me is a place in the Dominican family and a desire to tell others about it. And that is what I'm happy to do today. Dr. Bender presented us with an insightful look at the often mistaken claim, I'm spiritual, but not religious. There's a fire within us, a force, that attracts us to God and to one another that is essentially religious, that is expressed in our spirituality. Folks may not be oriented toward an institutional expression of that spiritual fire. And perhaps that's our job of evangelization, to build together an institution where that fire can be nurtured, to give both heat and light to a people who are often cold and in the dark. Sister Lewis Mary picked up the theme by showing us the everyday spirituality that surrounds us. In a sense that identifies us as children of a loving God made to know, love, and serve God and neighbor, and to find joy in doing so in this life and the next, if I may apply St. Catherine's perspective that all the way to heaven. What I want to do is show what a spirituality that is both religious and institutional looks like in the Dominican family from my perspective as a relatively new member of that family. From what I've seen, what I've read, what I've heard, and most of all, from what I've experienced. There have always been those who are drawn to the charism of Dominic. There were early on, they were early on incorporated into the institutional religious life as friars and nuns. As friars and nuns, then as laity, organized canonically beneath the great Dominican cape, or better, beneath the cape of the Blessed Mother, whom Dominic found sheltering his brothers and sisters, apparently, at a family gathering in heaven. The reach of Dominican spirituality extended again and again into everyday life, drawing beneath that cape women as religious sisters who lived in the charism in active ways. And always along the way, there were the outliers who traveled alongside the family before being invited again. We all look to St. Catherine of Siena as the exemplar of one drawn to the Dominican life who kept at it until she found a place at the table. And that's the perspective that 
I bring to this series, an associate who was for years a Dominican without knowing it until he was invited in. The Dominican associates are people who are drawn to the lived spirituality of the Dominicans to such an extent that we realize it begins to fulfill that desire that is in us. And in the last 30 years, we found a place created for us by our sisters to live into that spirituality in partnership with them for the sake of the mission. When St. Dominic founded the Order of Preachers, his mission was through effectively preaching the truth of the incarnate Christ to save souls who were starving due to the failure of the church's preachers to nourish them. It's not an esoteric mission. We seek the truth. We contemplate the truth even as we share it in prayer and action in study and community. It is this dynamic of contemplating and sharing that enlivens Dominican spirituality. Every sustained dynamic, though, needs a structure to give it direction and continuity. The structure that supports Dominican spirituality is fourfold. The pillars of community, prayer, study, and ministry. Betty Schlatterer's drawing here, reflecting on the pillars, comes from one of uh, our Dominican Associate group meetings. Betty Schlatterer has been a part of the Dominican Associates since before there were Dominican Associates. And this was um, part of the reflection that we had in our Bethany group. Betty drew this, and I feel it shows very clearly that role of pillars supporting our spirituality. By looking at each of these pillars of Dominican spirituality in this presentation, we'll have a chance to go more broadly into the overarching Dominican mottos, if you will, veritas, true, and contemplare et contemplata, Ali's Tradere, to contemplate and share with others what we contemplate. And the motto that is literally overarching the Mother House Chapel portals, Laudare, Benedicere, Predicare, to praise, to bless, to preach. And perhaps we will see how our spirituality is born from truth and moves outward through the pillars in service of that gentle truth who is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. According to Philip Sheldrick in his Introduction to Spirituality, A Brief History, one of the requirements for understanding spirituality as something more than a momentary experience is that it's capable of being passed on, living beyond the lifetime of its founder. The experience of Dominic and his earliest companions was fruitful in a focused way, but was not sustainable by the social or ecclesial structure that was immediately available to like other founders, Dominic pestered and persevered until he had an organization and an authorization to build that organization in such a way as to sustain a mendicant missionary spirituality. And that would certainly be a marker, I believe, of Dominican spirituality, a practicality that keeps its focus on the mission. In The Holy Longing, Ronald Rollheiser talks about healthy spirituality as being able to will the one thing. It is this single-minded focus on the mission that led Dominic and his 
followers to forego the security of living as cathedral canons and to embrace a mendicant, itinerant way of life. Although he established a secure environment for his earliest converts and women converts and followers, his community would live free of the restrictions and the benefits of what had been traditional monastic life. Once established, the Dominican community did not have long to coalesce and celebrate seeing a new family. In short order, Dominic sent his brothers away to become better prepared for the mission that brought the community into existence. What could hold a far-flung and disparate community together? Rollheiser here provides another insight. In speaking about what enables people to come together in the church and stay together when they are certainly not alike and may not necessarily always like one. We don't go to church, he says, to be with people who are like us. We go to church because we are gathered by and around the person of Jesus. It is a personal community. It is relational. Surely in this regard, the Dominican community is not unique. Rather, it is the Dominicans themselves who are unique. We have all heard the adage, that when you've met one Dominican, you've met one Dominican. Certainly, one unique facet of Dominican spirituality is the diversity among those who follow. It may be in order, but it's not always order. It is made up of women and men in touch with their unique spirits and personalities. And their individuality is not lost in community. It is this personal identity, in fact, that one brings to the community, and it is what helps to color it and to make the community more effective and certainly more interesting. In preparing this talk, I spoke with a number of folks, asking what it was that drew them to the Dominican life. Among the many responses I received, what do you think came through most strongly? Desire to serve God. Desire to serve God. Joy. Joy. Who were they? Accepting His will. Accepting God's will. And these were all the mission came through, the draw to truth. But the one thing that ran through all of them was that someone who was a Dominican invited them, either directly or indirectly, drew them into Dominican spirituality by their words, by their actions, by their examples. I won't tell their stories, but perhaps a bit of my own can serve as an example. From the time I was a little boy memorizing Bible verses, I knew the Lord had laid claim to me through His Word. And as I grew up, I tried different ways to live this claim in a more explicit way, to understand what it meant. When I was in college, I got in my mind that God must want me to be a priest. I, I knew men who modeled that way of life, and I tried to follow, first in seminary, after I graduated from college. But after a few years, I realized that just wouldn't come to pass, and I took some time off. And I did other things in the meantime, until I could figure out that priestly call. Well, among those things, there were many intersections with the then Sisters of St. Mary of the Springs. In fact, as far back as the 1960s, my classmate, Bernadette, had told me about the family excitement when her sister, Anna Teakin, and some of her Dominican sisters came home to Wheatersburg and modeled their new religious habits. And I was fascinated and 
The connections with the Dominicans just continued over the years. There was my pastor, Father Ralph Hunsinger, who published in the St. Mary Bulletin notice of his monthly Dominican meeting. And I wonder what that was. And Sister Carolyn Spencer, who opened up new ways for me to understand the church through her RCIA group at St. Mary's. But most particularly important was my involvement with the sisters in the 1960s through the Spirituality Network and the AIDS Service Image in presenting retreats for people who were affected by AIDS. The sisters saw the suffering in people's bodies and spirits, and our team worked to help them to come to peace, to prepare to die at that time. What was nothing short of amazing in this was that the Dominican community opened its high-rise mother house to this group of people so unimaginably different from them. Imagine three floors of the most outcast people of the decade sleeping in their building where they slept, eating in their dining room, pray in their chapel. I marvel at these Dominicans, and I still do. After I retired then from my career in state service, I spent a long period of seemingly unsuccessful, seemingly unsuccessful discernment with the diocese about my call to the priesthood. Utterly frustrated. I unloaded one day on Mary Coors, who was then a pastoral minister at St. Mary's in German Village. Mary, if you know her, just imagine. She asked me the obvious question, well, Jake, what do you want to do? Exasperated, I blurted out, be a Springs Dominican sister. <laughs> Well, she said, I hope you have a plan B, <laughs> because that's not going to happen. But like many ideas that come right out of the left field, it was the Holy Spirit who prompted me to blurt this out. And while it amused us both, it started me thinking about the sisters in an oddly serious way. And soon after, I had a call from my friend Anita Davidson, who told me about her new job with the Dominican Sisters, directing their associate program. And would I want to help her organize some data files? So I said yes, and the next thing I knew, I had said yes to finding out more about these associates. And when it came time to choose a companion, I remembered a small sister bright eyes who had prayed with us on one of those AIDS healing <laughs> weekends, sitting quietly in the back of the chapel. Little did I know that sitting quietly in the back was not the usual way Sister Kateri McCaffrey lived her life. <laughs> she agreed to take me on only because I had a car. And she had places she needed to go. <laughs> but what a blessing, because in journeying with her, in discernment and in our travels to offices of congressmen, newspaper editors, read for the world meetings, it became clear that I was a Dominican, and I could get closer to my own truth in the living community formed of Dominican sisters and associates. At the heart of the Dominican community is our relationship as individuals and as a community with the living God and with one another, with the church and the world. Such a relationship exists and is reinforced by the vows, the promises, and the commitments we make by the sacraments and prayers that we share, by our study and by the way we engage with the ministry 
and the mission of the community. Dominican spirituality is supported by the pillar of prayer, both the liturgical prayer of the church and the personal and corporate prayers of Dominicans. If our community is built around the person of Jesus, the place of encounter with Jesus is in prayer, supremely in the Eucharist and in Eucharistic devotions. The English Dominican Edward Yarnall, in the theology of Christian spirituality, describes spirituality as the combination of praying and living. The embodiment of prayer in life, he says, is the acceptable spiritual sacrifice of praise to God that we are called and empowered to offer. As the prayer that is the source and summit of Christian life, the Eucharist is central to the spirituality of the Dominican Word. It is at the same time both the sacrifice of Christ and the meal at which his body is shared and his body is nourished. A devotion to Jesus in the Mass and in the real presence of his body and blood are epitomized in Dominican spirituality by the Pange Lingua and its Tantum Ergo by St. Thomas Aquinas. The first Roman Catholic service I attended was benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. And Tantum Ergo, the first Catholic hymn, I sang. If God had claimed me by his word, it was by this experience that the Catholic faith took hold of my mind and my heart. It was beautiful, and it was true, and it was as close to me through prayer as it was to St. Thomas. Dominican prayer, however, is generally more mundane and our spiritual life is seldom sustainable in exquisite contemplation, but must return to earth in order to sanctify the rounds of the day in the liturgy of the hours, or Christian prayer, or the prayers of Christians. Some Dominicans pray seven or eight times a day, in choir and in private, while others pray morning and evening together when they can, or alone. We pray in monasteries, convents, friary chapels, mother houses, and our houses. Dominic's prayer often extended long into the night and was remarkable for several reasons, not least his nine ways of prayer. My students read about the nine ways when we study Dominican spirituality. Many of Dominic's patterns of body prayer are familiar from bowing before the altar, standing apart with eyes fixed in contemplation, arms raised or outstretched, praying as he walked, finding a place of solitude. The sticking point for many is his pattern of self-discipline or physical chastisement. This alien spiritual practice has been redeemed for me and made comprehensible to my students by understanding that we can offer to God in sorrow for our sins in union with Christ the real pains and the chastisements that just come our way. One unique expression of spirituality I experienced in meeting with the associates group of Sacred Heart Vishakta. As our gathering ended, we prayed Kampa and we sang O Lumen, O Light of the Church, Teacher of Truth, Rose of Patience, Ivory of Chastity. You freely poured forth the waters of wisdom. Preacher of Grace, unite us with the blessing. This tradition of prayer to St. Dominic was ingrained into their devotional life by Sister Teresita Watson and the Dominican sisters who long ministered in their parish and school. One cannot discuss Dominican spirituality 
without mentioning devotion to the Blessed Mother and the tradition associated with the Rosary. Whatever its antecedents and evolution, tradition maintains that Dominic was inspired to use the Rosary in his evangelizing the Albigensians. And Dominicans have long promoted its use for prayer and spiritual growth. Meditation on the mysteries associated with Christ and his mother ground one another, ground one in the truth of the Incarnation. The Rosary was the last prayer and conversation I had with Kateri as she lay unconscious in the hospital. I put in her hand the wooden rosary that she had given me, and I prayed it aloud, but I knew that she too was praying with me. The well-worn rosary at the sides and in the pockets of Dominicans is part of what holds us together. One of the great marks of Dominican spirituality is the dedication to study. Not just to study religious matters, but to explore the range of all that life has to offer. As we gather here on the campus of a Dominican university, we are undeniably aware that the study and education are part of the Dominican way of life. Remembering Yarnell's definition of spirituality as the convergence of prayer and life, we understand that study with the right intention is an expression of that spirituality. One of my students who had taken religion courses in other schools challenged me early in our study of Christian spirituality. I need to know what's true. I've read so much. Here's so much, she said, and I don't have time for anything that isn't true. Dominicans study to get at the truth of things. We educate to help others get at what is true. Because what is true can only lead one to the one who is true. People who feed themselves or are fed on what is not true starve. Dominic knew this and insisted that his followers study in order that they might be effective preachers of the word that gives life. Those who needed extra study time were excused from the rigorous prayer schedule and their study became prayer. The early Dominican sisters in Ohio came here to teach and in order to teach they had to learn. Dominicans founded and staffed schools and colleges, and they were students in those colleges as well. Here at Ohio Dominican University, the prominent presence of Dominicans in the Center for Dominican Studies, the position of Vice President for Mission and Identity, as our chaplain, and in the campus ministry office, clearly bespeaks the important connection between Dominican spirituality and Dominican education. And it is not coincidental that a number of the faculty here are Dominicans, sisters and associates alike in ministry. Just as prayer is not limited to chapels, study is not limited to schools. The ongoing study groups within the Peace Dominican community testify to its wider role in our spirituality. But the most outstanding evidence of the deep connection between study and the contemplation of truth and the physical and spiritual life of the congregation, I think, was the intensive and extensive study, prayer, and discussion that led to the formation of the Dominican Sisters of Peace. Years of working toward understanding the personal, the communal, the spiritual, the financial, the canonical, the administrative realities and challenges involved the most amazing devotion to study, 
prayer and process. The new Dominican community was built with faith and hope, certainly, but on a foundation arrived at in no small part by study and sharing the fruit of that study. The fourth pillar of Dominican spirituality is ministry, which can be understood as the active engagement that incarnates the Dominican mission of holy preaching. Ministry is how we become the holy preaching, or perhaps how the holy preaching becomes present and active in and through us. It's the fire that burns within us and makes us want to spread the good news around the world. It's our spirituality to preach. That preaching in action is the praxis of Dominican spirituality. Richard McBrien, in his work Catholicism, identifies the mutual interplay of reflection and action as praxis, which is something more than practice. The Dominican praxis, as I have observed it in the light of the Dominican Sisters of Peace, is precisely that active interweaving of contemplation, action, and reflection that bears fruit in so many ministries. Dominican contemplative reflection, unlike the Jesuit appeal to the imaginative sense, is first of all, it seems to me, an act of reason or thinking a thing through, as well as engaging one's feelings, but with a certain suspicion of their changeableness. This reason-based, holistic reflection allows the Dominicans to will one thing and set out concrete, practical ways to achieve it. When the former Springs Congregation opened the mission in Chimbote, Peru, my beloved Kateri went with the first group to found that ministry. She described to me the lengthy planning and packing, the study and preparation for the sake of the mission. They took trunks of goods they thought that would be unavailable in Peru. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, although Kateri did. When they got off the ship in South America, they believed they were certainly ready to engage in the mission of the congregation and to succeed. After the earthquake destroyed much of what they had brought and what they had built, the sense of inevitable success left Sister, but the needs of the mission came first, and that ministry has endured. Dominican spirituality seems able to will and work the impossible for the sake of the mission. Another aspect of Dominican spirituality is that ministry never ends. A Dominican never ceases to minister because the mission demands that one preach the word, be instant in season, and out of season, as St. Paul urged Timothy. This is a lesson taught to, if not learned by, a man who spoke at the Forest Center on spiritual gerontology a couple of years ago. He repeatedly referred to the challenge faced by the retired sisters who could no longer engage in ministry for the congregation. Until one of my beloved sisters, stood up and preached the word to this man. Despite her reasoned and spirited arguments, he refused to accept that prayer was an actual ministry, much less the ministry of presence that some of our elders are. And we all knew that he was not, in point of fact, a dominion. <laughs> ministry covers a wide range of activity, between mission founding and simply being present. The sisters engage in ministry in so many ways, some of which make money for the mendicants and some of which cost, but all of which serve the mission.
the teachers, the artists, the preachers, and the prayers. The ones who stir things up and the ones who make peace. All do so in proclamation of the love of God incarnate in Jesus Christ for the salvation of souls. And all that that means. This is a part of the Dominican life that the associates right now are working to be part of. We seek to make the things we do in our lives and our careers more than things that we do. By joining in the mission of the order and the congregation, associates' activities become ministry, supporting the spirituality of the entire community. These pillars of Dominican spirituality we have looked at, community, study, prayer, and ministry, stand on a firm foundation of truth and endure for centuries. But there is another image of the pillars and the spirituality they uphold. The community, prayer, study, and ministry are like a tree, are like trees growing so close together that with their roots deep in the faith, like living trees, they bend and expand, they branch out and begin over time to grow into one another. Maybe it becomes hard to see where one ends and the other begins. The pillars, these trees, become stronger by their flexibility and interdependence, able to endure what would shatter rigidity, and fell the one that stands tall and proud but alone. Dominican spirituality becomes then the canopy of these trees, sheltering many beneath and within their wide, wide roots. We are made to know, love, serve, and be happy with God. Dominican spirituality aims to spend itself to help humankind grow toward this general truth. Well, let's take a few minutes and get something to drink and snack on and come back together and do one of the things that we do well, which is to discuss.
Thank you. Those, those days of retreats, it was, it was just quite remarkable to, uh, to have, it literally was the most different group that you could, could imagine. Uh, mostly uh, gay men and uh, some African American women and those were, were our participants and our, uh, it was just a very different experience, I think, for, for them, certainly, to be invited into uh, the mother house of a Catholic order of sisters, but they, they seemed to take to it, right? Something that such a negative experience. Of church, that's exactly that was that was why this, these weekends were held, to help people come to some relationship with God and the church, because they had been rejected by their family, uh, first of all by their family, certainly by any religious tradition they were part of. So the Dominicans were, were doing some gentle preaching, just by saying, come in, come in as who you are. Of the 
unique part of this Dominican community. Please. I'm not an associate or anything, um, but, and I've met over the years a few Dominican sisters named that thing. Uh, but the two that come to my mind most recently, and I, I, I don't know if Dr. Barbara Pine is a sister or not, I'm not sure. Yes. I know that she's a sister, okay. And Sister Toma, uh, Sister Toma used to attend the daily mass at St. Dominic. And what I found with her and most of the Dominicans that I've met is there's such a sense of gentleness and peace and not afraid of the people, not afraid to mix with other people, but they speak their mind if they don't agree with something being said. I highly appreciate it. They, they surely do. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, but that's wonderful. That is a wonderful part of this, this spirituality of Dominicans that you what I love is you don't have to guess. You don't have to guess where I stand. You don't have to guess what they're really thinking. Because whatever comes out, it's not out of malice, it's out of sharing that general truth. We were never put into boxes. You know what I mean? Uh, some order they come out with them like
making sure people knew was that preaching is listening as well as speaking. And for myself, I remember way back in 1965, I as a young sister was going out to these fishing villages bringing the good news. And I arrived in the parish and a week later, a hurricane destroyed the homes and the boats that the fishing men used for fishing. And we spent the next week in the public school building with the people who was off there. And when we had a mass in the gym <clears throat> that weekend, all of the prayers were prayers of thanksgiving because there were no lives, no life lost. And I remember afterwards thinking, who is bringing the faith to <laughs> they were certainly teaching me trust in God, but to this day, I'm not sure I have. You know, and so being able to hear from these poor, little, uneducated people that couldn't tell you what the philosopher said or what this person taught or that person taught, but the truth that came from their hearts that God was still with them. And I think, you know, it's much of what you're saying, we need to be listening to everyone if we truly are bringing good news. To really spread that, that mutual contemplation of sharing out. Sharing involves listening. Thank you. That's, that's insight. That is part of our associate formation. I think that's the second or third month where people are assigned to research the Dominican Saint and sit and do those presentations together. Because that really is how, how we learn. I mean, we, the charism works through people. It, it has a life as it did with Dominic. It had hold of Dominic past that those beginnings drew him. But it's when we see that in each, each person that it becomes real. I was thinking of how the vocation, you know, how vocations are. And I was thinking of Gustavo Gutierrez, who uh, is a Dominican now. And at one of the meetings, somebody asked him, you know, why are you, why are you a Dominican? And he said,
Okay. Uh, I, I just was thinking, listening to everything here, I came here in 1995, five year old daughter. Never been, you know, to Ohio, needed a job, right? Joan was vice president, and then the saw something in me and, you know, invited me. And uh, I didn't become an associate until years later, but it was the hospitality and the concern, right? Uh, Sister Camilla arranged for where uh, Emily would go to school, right? Uh, she made arrangements that I would show up 10 minutes late for division meetings, right? And somebody would cover for me, right? And, uh, and I remember the first time I left here to visit my brother at Notre Dame, I was seated at the table at the uh, seminary, and he was introducing me. My sister just moved, you know, with my niece. He was with me. And, uh, uh, and uh, a small college, and, and I said, oh, you don't. And, and I said, oh, hi, Dominican. And this uh, fellow stood up. I'm Dominican. Do you know Mary Ann Petula? And I said, oh, she's right across the hall from me. And all those books of hers are wonderful. And I thought, this was a great race, you know, that I ended up there. Right? And anyway, so. And, and I'm pleased that a couple of us had uh, first dibs on those books along with Dr. Madden and Sister Mary Ann Tyler. Well, thank you all. Thank you so much.